Welcome to our session. I'm Prajikta. I'm a product manager in cloud networking. So I'm sure some of you are cloud natives. Some of you are enterprise customers. And one of the interesting things is when we talk to our enterprise customers, they say we want to deliver smart, secure, modern services, but we cannot. They think because they have deployments on-prem, or because they think it's difficult to deliver global services at scale with five nines of availability, or they think that microservices are cool, but not for them. Whether you're an enterprise or a cloud native, our goal today is to show you how you can deliver smart, secure, modern services on Google Cloud Platform. So let's get started. Let's start with smart application delivery. What smart smarts do our customers ask us for? They say deliver our services close to our users across the globe. They say help us deliver reliable services with five nines of availability. Scale our services up or down in line with our traffic. Optimize our services for latency and costs. And enable us to deliver and move our services across GCP, on-prem, and clouds. That is what smart application delivery is about. Global, reliable, auto-scaled, optimized, and portable. There are five key building blocks that enable smart application delivery. Cloud load balancing, cloud CDN, cloud interconnect, Kubernetes, and the container engine. Now, before we start talking about global load balancing, first let's talk about Google Cloud Load Balancing. I'm going to ask you one thing. Forget everything you know about load balancers. Let's start fresh. So we have five types of load balancing solutions, and we are going to focus on global load balancing. So essentially, HTTP load balancing for your HTTP traffic and your HTTP2 traffic as well. HTTPS load balancing for your HTTPS traffic. For your non-HTTP traffic, we have SSL proxy for your TLS traffic, and then TCP proxy for your unencrypted traffic. Let's start with global application delivery. There are numerous reasons why you might want to deliver your workloads or your services globally. Maybe you want to deliver your services around the globe. Maybe you need the highest levels of availability, so you want to replicate your services in all regions around the world. Or maybe you want to deliver your services with low latency by being close to your users. And this is what Google Global Load Balancing enables you to do. Instantiate your resources across the globe, front-end these with a single front-end whip, and deliver low latency, high bandwidth connectivity to your users. And with all of this, think of the Google Global Load Balancer as having infinite capacity, so it will never be a choke point. Like I said before, forget everything you know about load balancers. Let's look at this. The load balancer to your left is a traditional load balancer. On the right is the Google Global Load Balancing. And you might ask, where is the load balancer? There is really no load balancer there. That's exactly the point. The load balancing is all software and is done by GFEs, the Google front ends. The GFEs themselves are distributed around the globe in, in Google's POPs, and they load balance and sync with each other by working with other software-defined systems and the global control plane. Now, these GFEs terminate your traffic closest to your user and load balance the user request to the closest healthy backend with available capacity. So for a minute, just focus on the gray dots that you see on this map. These are Google's POPs, and they host the Google front ends. This is where your Google global load balancing happens, close to your users. And then the traffic gets sent to an instance in the closest data center over Google's high-quality, high-performance global network. Let's, let's look at this technology through an example. A key technology that is used in Google global load balancing is intelligent anycast. And basically, as shown in the example, you can deploy your service backends wherever you want, so in any of the regions. In this example, you have them in US West, in Europe, and in Asia. But now is the interesting bit. What you will notice is you front-ended all of them with a single whip, 
In another cloud provider, you would have required three VIPs, one per region. And I want to make an interesting announcement. So we have supported global load balancing for IPv4 clients for now close to two years. And today, we are excited to introduce Google Global Load Balancing for IPv6 clients as well. So as shown in this example, your service myapp.com has a single v6 WIP, 2001 DB8 10. And so Maya in California, Bob in London, and Shen in Singapore. They all can connect to your service using a single AnyCast WIP, 2001 DB8 10. The request is automatically load balanced to the instance closest to them with available capacity. So this is a unique differentiation for Google's global load balancing. You will not get this in any other cloud provider. So now that we talked about Google global load balancing, one of the key considerations for any solution is performance. And so when we launched the Google global load balancer, I think about two years back, we wanted to see how it performs, and we threw a lot of traffic at it. We stopped at 1 million requests per second, because it just went on and on and on, handling the request seamlessly. Another great example. So how many of you are familiar with Pokemon Go? How many of you are not familiar with Pokemon Go? <laughs> so Pokemon Go is a great example of the scale and performance Google Global Load Balancing can deliver. So when the game was first introduced, within 15 minutes of launching this game, the player traffic really surged. And in fact, the traffic was 50x of the initial target and 10 times the worst case estimate. We obviously needed to do something to handle this traffic. So Pokemon applications were moved to containers. They were orchestrated at this massive scale using Google Container Engine. And these container backends were front-ended by the HTTPS load balancing to handle the massive traffic that Pokemon Go was seeing. So all your traffic was actually being handled by the Google Global Load Balancer. So now we talked about delivering your services globally. What next? The next thing we want to do is to optimize your services for latency and costs. And a really great tool to use for this purpose is content delivery networks. Now what a CDN does is it caches your site's content all around the world, speeding delivery to your users while also offloading your origins. And so Google Cloud Platform has its own native solution called the Cloud CDN. And we also have seven interconnect partners. So essentially what you have is choice. Just like cloud load balancing, Cloud CDN is also delivered using Google's high-performance global network and the edge infrastructure, of course. And it uses Google's 80-plus points of presence to ac accelerate content delivery for your websites and for your applications. And these could be served out of Compute Engine or out of storage as well. So two interesting things I wanted to point out about Cloud CDN. One, that it is very tightly integrated with the Google Cloud Platform. And so if you've set up HTTP or HTTPS load balancing, you can just enable it with a single checkbox. The other thing I wanted to point out, uh, I think most of you know that Google believes in TLS everywhere. And so we do not charge extra for TLS traffic, so for HTTPS. And so we recommend that as a default configuration. You will not be, be paying anything extra for CDN for using TLS. So we talked earlier about this tight integration, and we said you could enable Cloud CDN with a single checkbox. I also wanted to discuss a new feature that we are introducing. Now, Cloud CDN also gets its own UI. So you can see on the screen, there is a left navigation bar that has Cloud CDN. And so now you can go here as well and configure all of the advanced configurations and special knobs that you need for your CDN. So you're, you're the first people actually looking at this uh, snapshot of the screen, but it just rolled out today. So please try it out. Just like cloud load balancing, performance is, again, a very key consideration for cloud CDNs. Uh, how many of you have heard of Sedexis? Great. So um, Sedexis is, is essentially a web traffic optimization and analytics company. And they recently published data on the cloud CDN performance. So I've included the link on the slide. Uh, I'm just going to walk you through some of the highlights. As you can see here, Google Cloud CDN has much lower latency than our public cloud competitors. So we have our competitor and ours. Ours is the line in green. So lower the latency, better. 
It has much higher availability as well. So again, you can see the green line is on the top. And it definitely has much throughput, much higher throughput as well. So I purposely added the link to the report so you can view it offline. So we talked about global load balancing, and we talked about optimizing your workloads. But one of the things that most of you bring to us is, we have a deployment on-prem, or we are into clouds. And Google is an open cloud. So the interesting thing about either migrating or managing across clouds is that you require the right set of tools. We don't have enough time to go into all of the tools, but I did want to talk about two tools that our customers use frequently. One such tool for multi-cloud automation that several of our GCP customers use is Terraform. So it's a tool by HashiCorp. Now, Terraform has a declarative config, and so operators can very predictably and safely create, modify, and destroy production infrastructure across multiple clouds. So it's infrastructure as code, basically. Another popular tool that we see a lot of enterprises and cloud natives use is Spinnaker. And so if you look at the sample dashboard, this is a live dashboard from uh, a snippet of a live dashboard from Waze. And as you can see on the dashboard, Waze is able to manage both GCP and AWS using Spinnaker in a single pane of glass. And there are many such tools. So I think just finding the right set of tools to manage your migration and deployment also makes it much, much easier. But the best portability actually comes from making your workloads portable. And you can do this with containers. We have excellent sessions on containers throughout this conference. And once you have your workloads that are containerized, you can orchestrate them with Kubernetes, which is our open source container orchestration tool. Or you can use Google Container Engine. So it's essentially our managed version of Kubernetes on Google Cloud. And there's a reason I put this slide here. If you will notice, there is a bunch of enterprises in here and cloud natives as well. And so you can see that both of them use Google Container Engine and Kubernetes for workload portability. So I highly recommend that you look at these two uh, services as well. So we talked about modern, and we delivered our workloads across the globe. And then we optimized them, and then we took care of hybrid cloud and multi-cloud. The next thing is, think of any of the Google services that you use. Let's say Search, or Gmail, or Drive. And you automatically have a secure connection, a TLS connection to Google. So just like that, you have a variety of tools to actually secure your services in the Google Cloud. I'm going to focus on four aspects of secure application delivery. One. Controlled access to your application instances, delivering private services, TLS everywhere, and something that's on the top of your mind, DDoS defense. You have four building blocks in here, so let's walk through them. The first one is essentially controlling access to your instances. And this is basically determining who gets access to your instance and who is denied access to your instance. And a key tool that you can use here is the GCP distributed firewall. So often people ask us, like, what is distributed, or what does it mean in this context? Unlike traditional firewalls, where you have to actually take the traffic and steer it to a middle box, which often itself becomes a choke point, GCP enforces the firewall rules on the application instance itself, and hence the term distributed. The second one is just like we talked about global load balancing. A lot, lot of you run microservices, or services that you want to keep private and not exposed to the internet. So we recently introduced internal load balancing, which allows you to run and scale your services or your microservices privately. And the load balancing IP address is, again, RFC 1918 private address. So you can see an example on the screen where you have instances running in subnet 2 and subnet 3, and an internal client from subnet 1 is able to access the service privately without going to the internet. One interesting thing I want to point out, so people tell us, like, you have all of these tricks under the hood. And that is true even for internal load balancing. Just like other Google global load balancing flavors, the internal load balancing is not a managed instance or appliance-based solution. It is architected using Andromeda, so that is our software-defined network virtualization stack. And so basically, your intern there is really no internal load balancer in the path, which is what you see on the screen. And so it can scale as much as is needed to handle your workloads. So there is, again, no choke point in your network. The third thing is TLS everywhere. So if your traffic is HTTPS, 
Uh, you can use HTTPS load balancing. And for all of your non-HTTPS traffic, which is encrypted, you can use SSL proxy. So this is, again, a new flavor we introduced a few months back. It went GA a few months back. And both HTTPS load balancing and SSL proxy are global load balancing flavors, which means you can offload your TLS traffic for your instances, no matter where they are, like whichever region they are, with a single AnyCast WIP, just like we talked about before. And both, as I mentioned before, both cloud load balancing and cloud CDN do not charge extra for TLS traffic. So there is no reason you should not be using TLS traffic. And then DDoS defense. So we haven't talked about it before, but I don't know how many of you know that when you deploy Google Cloud Load Balancing or Cloud CDN, you actually get implicit layer 3 and layer 4 DDoS protection. So things such as against TCP SYN floods or IP fragmentation attacks and so on. And then you can complement this further with protection from our third-party DDoS providers. So you see a few of them on the screen, like Cloudflare, Fastly, uh, Akamai, and several others. And so I wanted to end the secure part of it with this blueprint. Um, I'm not going to go into it in a lot of details, but think of it as protecting layer with another layer. So you have your secure VPC. You have your secure hybrid connectivity. You complement that with third-party virtual appliances. Then you deploy the Google Global Load Balancer to get the DDoS defense. And then you finally have Google's high-capacity, high-performance global network. And you get protection even against UDP-based attacks. And then all of this you complement using the DDoS defense from third-party providers. So it's just a layered approach to security that will keep your services secure. So we talked about smart, and we talked about secure. Now I'd like to invite my colleague Anna to come and talk about modern services. Anna, please come on. Thank you, Projector. Uh, my name is Anna Berenberg, and I'm a TLO load balancing in Google. And today we're going to be talking about modern application delivery on GCP. And what does modern mean? It's modular, optimized, composable, and open. And it's all achievable with the help of this Google Cloud and open source solutions. Let's look at, evol uh, at the evolution of services to microservices. We can start with the ancient uh, age of 15, 20 years ago when uh, we had a monolithic application and all the functionality was built into it. And as our users started to demand a lot of functionality, we naturally split application into services. And once we knew how to split, we split and split more until we split into microservices. And here we are today at the stage of modern microservices where we are saying that the future of microservices is containers, uh, serverless, GRPC for uh, to tra transport layer to microservices, and load balancing to bind all the microservices together to a service. Google itself spent 15 years running microservices. There are three basic building blocks. There is a Borg, which is container management system at Google, uh, which we open source as Kubernetes and brought it back to the cloud as GKE. There is a Stabi, which is internal transport layer, which we open source as gRPC and now is available uh, in the cloud. And there's a GSLB and GFE, which are our global load balancing solution that powers up uh, cloud load balancing that Projector was talking about. As you can see, uh, service, microservices can be spread across multiple environments on Google Cloud. But if you look underneath, they're all powered by a single Google load balancing infrastructure. And for some environments, uh, some environments use the explicit products like cloud load balancing, and some managed environment like App Engine or Cloud Functions are using Google load, balance in, Google load balancing infrastructure internally. There are four basic load balancing products, and they're going into different dimensions. You can cut, slice them, uh, whether they're global or regional, whether they serve external or internal traffic, uh, and different protocols. More flavors are coming. Uh, 
And if you can look here at backend service API, this is the API uh, that actually allows us to configure microservice. Let's look at the microservice deployment in Google Cloud. Aside from managed uh, deployments like App Engine and Google uh, Functions, we can look at, at the computer, com container engine and compute engine. And you can see that for a, on an instance, you can have two applications, each with one port or n applications, or the instance with one application and multiple ports, uh, or have the key ports with one or many uh, ports with one or many ports, and we can load balance to microservice endpoints. We will be taking an example today of uh, delivering traffic microservices to the images and videos of cats and dogs. Uh, how many of you watched videos of cats? Yay! According to tubularinsights.com, uh, there were 25 billion videos watched on YouTube, and the dogs don't even come anywhere close. So with such, we're going to split the service into two microservices. Right? One for dogs, one for cats. And in front of each microservice, we'll put a load balancer so we can abstract the set of servers that change their geolocation, their health, their number of services with just a single uh, IP, load balanced IP port. We call it WIP. Even though microservices are small, their needs are very large. But today, due to time limit, we are going to be talking only about load balancing, auto scaling, health checking, and high availability. Let's talk about modular part of modern application delivery. Besides optimizing for modularity for uh, event-driven interfaces and improve uh, velocity, we also want to optimize for uh, resource utilization, user and service perceived latency, and the behavior, custom behavior, which uh, each microservice can exhibit. We already talked before how to split cats and dogs based on amount of QPS. But here you can also say that if I have a, a, a different set of URLs or names, I can actually have a microservice for each endpoint that can be named. Or you can split the microservices by a bottleneck. Let's say images are CPU bound, by videos are connection bound, right? Um, as you can see, not everybody likes cats and dogs equally. So what do we do? Uh, when we try to place uh, our microservices, we need to look how to place microservices as close to the user as possible. That's one. And the second thing, we can actually optimize by placing uh, services only where they need it. For example, there is no need to place a lot of cats in Asia because dogs enjoy 2.5 to 1 advantage. Uh, so talking about more about optimization, we can optimize delivery of traffic based on the behavior of different bottleneck of the services. For example, that for the images, we can configure load balancing, be array-based, and uh, the capacity, let's say, of 1,000 RPS, while for videos, they're connection-based, and so we will provision, uh, let's say, 500 connections. And let's say we have a set of instances that share this microservices on each instance. What's going to happen that we will route traffic, we will load balance traffic independently. So as soon as the first, um, let's say, uh, the images uh, will reach 1,000 RPS within a single zone, the traffic will, would be moved away without regards to how many connections the videos are receiving on the same instances. So each microservice uh, load balanced independently. Or let's say we have a set of uh, microservices that share CPU. So we want to optimize CPU resource utilization, but we also don't want to overwhelm CPU with a one of the, let's say we have a jumping cat video, which is going to probably uh, use more CPU than the serving images. And so in this case, we, um, we notify Cloud Autoscaler 
how to sum up um, CPU utilization of all the in all the microservices that run on the same on the same instance, and then autoscaler will uh, increase or decrease number of instances based on common utilization. Let's say autoscaling is not enabled. Let's say your application cannot use autoscaler. Then the load balancer itself knows what are the microservices that share um, share these instances, and it will uh, consider traffic as a sum of uh, traffic across all the, all the instances, all the microservices within this instance, and move the traffic away as soon as it reaches configured target utilization. So to provide minimum interruption to a service, uh, to traffic, uh, when the instance is removed or uh, terminated, uh, we provide connection draining, so only new connections are being delivered to non-drain instances. And the uh, uh, drain instances continue to serve existing connection until configured timeout expires. So if you look here at example, let's say there are two instances, A and B, and it's, let's say it's evening, and the traffic goes down. So instance A is sufficient to serve traffic for both images and videos, and Cloud Autoscaler wants to bring uh, down instance B. Then in this case, um, it'll wait until both uh, connection are being drained, and you would imagine that for videos, the connection timeout will be much longer than for the images. And so it'll wait until both of them drain out, and only then it'll take down the, the, the service, the, the instance, sorry. We provide health checking for microservices. So it's, again, not per instances, not per GKE port, but actually per, per microservice for each IP port uh, that is available. Different protocols, content-based health check, and per microservice configuration where you can configure different probes, a different uh, number until healthy, unhealthy, et cetera. Let's look at the example of com composable uh, application delivery. So we talked about, the first we split, then we talk about optimization, and now we're talking how to take the, the microservices and actually make a service out of it. Uh, and here's an example of typical three-tier application that is spread across different Google envir Cloud environments and using also our cloud uh, managed services that are high availability and where high availability is actually achieved through load balanced failover, like uh, cloud scale. And that's another example of a non-tiered architecture. And I can go a little bit deeper in this example because um, let's say uh, somebody uploads the image of the dog and it goes to image services and image services will call up cloud functions with a pub sub to, to get some um, special effects, and then it sends it machine learning for breed tagging, and then for geotagging to get uh, to know where the dog is most popular. And then it gets saved, let's say, in the GCS. And once it hits GCS, it, it triggers GCS event on, in a cloud function. And then this cloud function produces uh, no less than rotating puppy. And rotating puppy with a... Uh, uh, breed tagging and geotagging get saved back into the, into the GCS. And so when some user asks for uh, a puppy, it gets a GIF of rotating puppy known as a bulldog, which is also known to be very popular in New York City. Let's talk about open part of modern application delivery. Um, we use uh, gRPC's open source uh, uh, transport layer, and there are a lot of advantages of using it because we use, it's based on protocol buffers. It allows for backward compatibility and language operability. And because it has layered extensions, it allows for to layer authentication, load balancing, and logging. And because it allows to control, send the service configuration to client, it allows service owner to control the client's settings. 
typically when we talk about uh, microservice load balancing, we, we, we talk about uh, load balancing type of proxies, right? But there are a lot of different ways of uh, load balance traffic. Uh, you can have a proxy in the middle, you can have sidecar, or you can have what's called one-arm one load balancing. And one-arm load balancing is interesting because it's actually not on data path. And so it doesn't introduce extra latency, and it doesn't, it doesn't become a choke point like Projecta was alluding before. So you don't have to over-provision it. And so in this situation, you, your initial connection goes to load balancer, and then subsequently load balance streams on the background backends to, to the client, so the clients can talk to servers directly. And the reason I'm talking about it is because at Google, that's what we are using for internal load balancing. We're using one arm load balancer, and we are hoping to bring it soon uh, to cloud. And so to recap and to summarize, uh, modern microservices on Google Cloud benefit from fine-grained scalability through load balancing and uh, auto-scaling. Um, it also allows you to mix, mix and match of your services and our managed cloud services. And the future of compute is a container engine and cloud function. Thank you. I would like to introduce uh, Ravi Adula, Senior Director of the Home Depot. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, my name is uh, Ravi Adula. I'm a Senior Director on the Home Depot.com team responsible for uh, cloud platform architecture and uh, the migration of Home Depot.com to Google Cloud. Uh, I've been with uh, Home Depot for the last uh, six years, and for the last uh, 15 to 18 months, I've gotten to know Google really well. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here and share our story with you guys today. Uh, so my talk is going to be broken down into three different parts. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about uh, why cloud native and why uh, public cloud. And then I'm going to talk about uh, uh, basically our hybrid cloud architecture and uh, cloud native architecture. And then I'm going to close out with uh, the key lessons learned as part of this journey. Uh, uh, before we begin the talk, uh, 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 just a raise of hands. How many of you recognize Home Depot here today? How many of you don't? Great. Uh, so Home Depot is uh, one of the most recognized and the iconic brands in the US. It's the world's largest uh, home improvement retailer with well over 2,000 stores in the US, Canada, and Mexico, and generated over $94 billion in revenue last year. Uh, many of you might know the large uh, physical footprint of Home Depot, uh, but uh, we are actually a really big e-commerce shop. We are, in fact, a top 10 e-commerce website and generated over $5 billion in revenue last year. Uh, from an industry recognition perspective, uh, in 2016, Fast Company recognized Home Depot as one of the top 50 most innovative companies in the US. And in fact, uh, we were the only retailer in that group, among the likes of uh, Apple and Google. And in 2015, uh, we were also recognized as the Internet Retailer of the Year uh, for a pioneer in interconnected retail uh, against the competition of Amazon and Walmart. And uh, last but not the least, uh, we are absolutely hiring. Uh, so uh, uh, hiring cloud software engineers, cloud product engineers. Uh, and if you're interested in helping us sell more nails and hammers, uh, please, uh, please hit me up after the talk. Great. So uh, uh, journey to the cloud. Uh, so why, why cloud native? Uh, many might uh, actually look at uh, cloud native as a technology decision. For us, it was actually a business decision. It was uh, to help us unlock real business value and agility and uh, deliver more features and benefits to our ever-increasing expectations of the e-commerce customers. In fact, when I joined Home Depot in 2010, all we could do was basically add an item to the cart and ship it to your house. Today, you can ship the products to the house, you can pick up in the store, you can uh, ship to the store, you can actually deliver the product to the store, you can specify a two-hour time slot to say, hey, hey, deliver my product from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. And all that requires a really solid technical architecture foundation and the capability to introduce features really at a rapid pace. Uh, as, uh, okay. uh, for as many of you are experiencing or undergoing, uh, like many enterprises, pre-2012, 
uh, we were a large legacy monolithic platform. Uh, it was uh, a big platform, just had one large team, and we were all uh, trying to make changes, and it was difficult to make the changes because we had to regression test the entire site. Uh, and uh, as you can see, the release cycles were three months long, uh, multiple months long, uh, based on the complexity of the release cycle. And that's where we wanted to do something about, hey, how do we increase the feature velocity so that we can actually deliver features at a much faster pace? Uh, 2012 to 2016, we actually broke down our monolithic application into what I call mini monoliths. So we broke down our one large application to about between 15 to 20 different uh, small applications. And we realized benefits uh, pretty soon thereafter. Some teams were able to increase their feature velocity from three months to a month. Uh, they were partially independent teams. Not all teams became independent. Uh, some teams like Search or Store Locator, Store Finder, because they were not part of the core e-commerce bypath, they were able to push out features at a faster pace. And as you can see, some teams actually uh, uh, were releasing between two weeks to one month. Uh, but, but it was not good enough. Uh, if you wanted to roll out uh, something like pickup in store, you have to go from all the way from your product page to search, resu uh, search results to PLP to product page and the cart. And how do you actually decompose all those teams so that they can deliver uh, at a much faster pace? So in 2015, uh, late 2015, uh, we decided to go completely cloud native. And that's where uh, you can see uh, our site is now broken up into about 80 microservices and growing. Uh, we expect to top around uh, 120 microservices when it's completely done. And now teams are able to actually release between a day to a week, depending on their uh, velocity and pace. And they're also mostly independent teams. And that's the key. Uh, going to a microservice architecture is not about actually decomposing the application. It's actually enabling the application teams to be completely independent. If your teams are not independent, it's actually worse off. You, all you've created is actually a distributed monolith. You made your architecture more complex, but you created many, many more communication paths and dependencies across teams. So make sure, as part of your journey, if you're doing it, pressure test. Are your teams really independent or not? Uh, so, uh, so when we started the cloud journey, we wanted to make sure that we have core principles defined uh, as part of uh, uh, moving to public cloud. And as you can imagine, uh, us being a Fortune 25 company, dealing with customer data, PII, and PCI, security as, is at the forefront and the first thing that we want to make sure that we get it right. So we want to make sure that we have the right uh, tools and processes in place to protect our customer data. Uh, LegacyHomeDepot.com actually ran out of a single data center. So uh, if the data center had any issues, uh, we would have uh, site downtime, and customers would not be able to buy products or actually research products uh, to buy in the store. So the f one of the biggest things that we set out to do was we have to have multi-data center or multi-region high availability. And then the third thing uh, that we wanted to do was immutable infrastructure. My current, uh, the legacy HomeDepot.com platform, uh, we had some automation built in, but uh, most of the automation was uh, around starting and stopping the servers, uh, taking servers offline, but any configuration changes were made directly on the physical host. So we didn't treat our infrastructure as code. And so if you had to recreate an environment, it took us weeks and maybe up to a month to replicate the environments uh, uh, cleanly. So the repeatability was lost. So we wanted to make sure that we have a repeatability uh, from the get-go. Uh, and that ties well into the next one. Uh, to achieve repeatability, you need automation. And uh, with automation, you treat infrastructure as code. And that way, anytime you want to spin up a new environment, uh, you just execute your automation scripts, and you want to make any changes, you spin up new environment. Don't make changes to the existing uh, infrastructure that you just provisioned. And last but not the least, uh, as part of the microservice architecture, when I mean, you're going from one big monolithic database to maybe 10 different databases, from 10 servers or 20 servers to hundreds of small servers, if you don't have the right monitoring and reliability engineering principles, it becomes chaotic because you don't know what went wrong. You'll just uh, spin your wheels trying to troubleshoot. So make sure, uh, we wanted to make sure that we have the right team and the right policies in place that enable uh, the right monitoring and reliability engineering principles uh, for us to be successful as part of this journey. 
Uh, so uh, brief, uh, I want to uh, just jump into uh, the architecture that we have in the cloud today. As you can imagine, uh, Home Depot.com has a large technology footprint. Uh, we have uh, 2,000 stores. We have a lot of master data uh, that resides uh, inside Home Depot. And uh, I mean, we can't move all of it to the cloud, so we'll always be in uh, hybrid cloud mode. Uh, I highly doubt we'll ever be completely uh, all into the cloud. Uh, so we need, to move, uh, we need to find ways to move the master data, whether it is uh, product catalog, images, metadata, securely to the cloud. And we closely partnered with uh, Google Cloud engineers, used the Google Cloud Interconnect product uh, and VPN to move the data uh, securely to the cloud. And as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, we use all the security features, whether it is security tags, firewall rules, the right IAM policies to make sure that the data lands securely uh, in the cloud. And the, the path between uh, Home Depot data centers and Google Cloud uh, is multi-geo redundant. Uh, we actually go over three different paths. One via East Coast, one via Midwest, and one via West Coast. So if any time any path is unavailable, uh, we have a path back into Google Cloud. And the, the next one uh, is basically, as you can see, uh, the, the migration of Home Depot.com into Google Cloud is not a big bang approach. We migrated parts of it over long periods of time. And, uh, and uh, for that, uh, you might have a shopping cart running inside the legacy shopping cart running in Home Depot data centers and trying to talk to a promotion API in Google Cloud. And vice versa, you have shopping cart in Google Cloud talking to an inventory API inside the Home Depot because inventory is uh, global between stores and online. And to enable secure communication between the two, uh, we worked uh, uh, closely with Google engineers, uh, use the API gateway on our side, uh, going through the same interconnect path uh, to make sure that the data is securely uh, transferred uh, between the two locations. Uh, Multi-region high availability. Uh, as I said, uh, from the get-go, we wanted to make sure that we run across multiple regions. So this was not uh, Home Depot.com didn't start out just running in one region and then added another region as bolt-on. Uh, we started out with U.S. East and U.S. Central from the get-go. Uh, here I just showed two um, uh, uh, zones in each region. We actually run out of three zones in each. The two zones here are just for clarity purposes. Uh, so we have three zones in U.S. Central and three zones in U.S. East, and all the databases are actually replicated across all six zones. So we have three copies in U.S. Central, three copies in U.S. East, and we also make a backup every day uh, back into GCS. And this is actually one of the uh, strongest features uh, for, our, uh, uh, for choosing Google Cloud. The, a, uh, in Google Cloud VPC, our project, uh, the, all regions are globally visible. Basically, you can, the VMs are globally visible across US East and US Central, and setting up replication is extremely easy. In other cloud providers, you have to go through myriad of setup paths between whether it's VPC peering, whether it's VPN, or going over the public internet to transfer or replicate the data across those two regions. So Google Cloud uh, our network and uh, the global visibility really helped us and made it really simple for us. And, and on the front end, uh, as Projecta said, uh, we, we, have a, we use layer seven load balancer, and we have a single global IP. Uh, the global IP basically is smart enough to route the request to the closest region back uh, based on the customer's location. So if somebody is visiting Home Depot.com from Washington, the request is routed to uh, US East, which is in South Carolina. Or if somebody is visiting uh, .com from uh, Chicago, the request is routed to uh, US Central. And this also uh, gives us the ability to actually uh, test DR, as in, what, what happens if, we, if U.S. East goes away? Or what happens if U.S. Central goes away? We want to make sure that we can survive the loss of a single zone in a region or a complete region outage and not affect our, our reliability or SLO back to our customers. So this architecture enabled us to uh, easily achieve that. And in the future, if you wanted to add another region, whether it is uh, U.S. West or the newly announced uh, California region, it becomes uh, very simple. We don't have to do any DNS record changes. We don't have to uh, make any changes anywhere else other than just adding the VMs in the right region. 
and the traffic automatically gets routed, uh, and customers benefit from uh, increased performance. Uh, so, uh, as I said, we run out of six zones. So, what does a zone look like? Uh, basically, uh, every zone is its own independent copy of the entire website. Uh, as you can see, uh, we run only on VMs. We do not do containers today. Uh, the main reasons for using VMs are uh, network isolation, segmentation, and data persistence. Uh, containers, so we are looking at it uh, someday. May maybe, maybe we'll look at it. Uh, the, uh, each VM uh, uh, runs only one microservice, and we have smaller VMs that just scale out. Uh, as you can see, basically we have clusters of different services uh, that just scale out using auto scaling based on traffic demand. Uh, each uh, zone also has a service registry cluster, so when uh, new services come up, they register their services in the service registry cluster and are visible to the clients in the same zone. Uh, the, the load balancing from client to uh, services in the same zone is through client-side load balancing. We don't use internal load balancer, uh, mostly in part because uh, ILB was not available when, when .com uh, went live. Uh, uh, zone is our fault is isolation domain uh, so that the uh, blast radius is contained. Any faults or any issues that we have in one zone don't uh, propagate uh, into regional falls or global falls. Uh, and the, the other uh, cool thing that we do is actually basically, as you can see, we have uh, uh, databases per service. So if a service needs a database, it gets its own database. There is no database sharing between multiple microservices. Uh, service A, if it wants a database, it has its own database cluster. Service D, whether it's examples of shipping or promotion, would have its own database cluster. And there is uh, network firewall rules that will limit the access between the right service to the right database. So service A here cannot access service D. And the other thing that we do is uh, our service, uh, services, when they want to talk to the database, the credentials are not stored in any config files, property files, or encrypted uh, file systems. We actually have a secrets uh, registry cluster uh, per zone. And whenever any VM comes up, it talks to our secrets registry gets the DB credentials dynamically per VM. So every VM gets, the, gets its own DB credentials. There is no shared DB credentials across VMs. And that enables us to contain uh, the, uh, any uh, issues that we have uh, and be absolutely sure that uh, the environment is secure. Awesome. So, uh, so we began this journey about 15 months ago, uh, uh, learned a lot. Uh, partnered with uh, Google. Uh, they helped us uh, learn quite a few things, and I'm sure they learned a lot from, from us. Uh, it's been a great partnership. So I just want to leave you with uh, what are the key lessons learned as part of this journey. Uh, we are about 75% uh, uh, into uh, the migration. So about 75% of uh, Home Depot.com traffic is now uh, sold out of Google, and we will finish this uh, uh, in the next five to six months. Uh, we did a pretty good job in uh, actually moving to microservice architecture, but uh, we dumped all our microservices into a single GCP project. So we didn't follow the same principles uh, in, in uh, choosing the project size. So GCP project size matters. Uh, we have hundreds, thousands of VMs in one GCP project. Uh, you run into limitations between uh, instance quotas, console uh, becoming really slow, many people working in the same project. Uh, so favors break up your GCP projects into small projects as well. Uh, as you can see, uh, one of the biggest benefits of cloud is auto scaling. So we don't have to pre-provision the infrastructure that we need for peak uh, demand, and we leverage uh, auto scaling quite heavily. And uh, GCP auto scaling works really well. Uh, the VM instances spin up in 40 seconds and are ready to take traffic. But make sure when your VM instances spin up. Uh, there, there are no external dependencies. Uh, some of our applications, like Search, uh, they download huge index file from storage when a VM boots up. And the index file is uh, somewhere around three to five gigabytes. That takes time. And search engines typically need warm-up time before they can serve traffic. And then the way uh, auto scaling is designed and the way we actually route traffic, as soon as the instance comes, instance comes up, 
guest register in the service registry, it's ready to take traffic. So we've seen issues where instances are up, but we, the performance actually goes down because traffic is routed and the VMs are struggling to serve the traffic. So make sure that the external dependencies are minimized as part of your bootstrap. Uh, telemetry, uh, what's the telemetry patterns? Uh, On-prem, uh, we used logs uh, to do telemetry. So basically, logs are used for uh, HTTP response codes, latency, and availability. Uh, we ported the same pattern to the cloud, and it gave us similar metrics. But, but in cloud, you want even more metrics. You just don't want uh, the regular availability, latency. Uh, uh, we want uh, key business metrics. You want metrics around, hey, how much memory am I using? How much memory am I using to serve this particular request? Uh, is the CPU low or high on one segment of request? I mean, those are not available if you just rely on log-based uh, telemetry. So we are actually uh, moving to uh, StatsD. Uh, today, the logs-based uh, uh, telemetry is through Fluent, the Google FluentD and CollectD plugins. We're going to move to StatsD. So the application itself uh, uses the StatsD library, exposes whatever metrics they want to expose directly uh, into StatsD, and then StatsD uh, communicates to the Google monitoring API uh, for different set of metrics. And uh, last but not the least, resiliency. Uh, now, when you're running on-prem, you assume the network is going to be stable. You assume the file system is going to be available. There's not a whole lot of uh, cross-zone interaction, cross-DC interactions. But, but in public cloud, you have, as I said, we run across six zones. Uh, there's a lot of network connections, a lot of microservices. We have cross-location connections. Uh, resiliency is key. Uh, for example, as part of the migration, we had one service in Google Cloud reaching out to, uh, let's say, a uh, header service, basically the header bar that shows up, the top navigation bar, and that was running in uh, on-prem. And the service al always assumed that the data returned is going to be right, or if the data was not available, just show the message back to the, the error message back to the user. And some instances, because of the network connectivity between, between Google and the Home Depot on-prem data center, uh, the data was not returned or it was an error, and the user saw uh, the page without the top navigation bar. So make sure you have uh, resiliency built in. Don't assume network is going to be available. Don't uh, just assume that, hey, I uh, connected to a service instance, it returned me some data or returned an error, and don't and not retry. Make sure you have some retry policies built in. Uh, so that uh, you can show uh, the right messages and have the right resiliency for your customers. And that's it. So I'd like to introduce uh, Prajakta back uh, for the demo. So. so thank you, Ravi. Um, it's always great when customers come here and then they talk Instance about the real pain points. And then they talk about their real world deployments. Nothing can beat that. Like whatever we say before, it doesn't matter. So I did want to take the opportunity to thank Ravi and the Home Depot. They've been phenomenal partners. And like he said, they learned from us, but we learned a whole lot more from them, especially on the pain points of enterprises and then how to make sure that Google Cloud is the cloud for enterprises and cloud natives. So in the same uh, train, we wanted to actually end this, pro uh, this presentation with some action. So we wanted to uh, give you a sneak preview at our IPv6 global load balancing. And with that, I'm going to ask our friends at the back to play the demo for us. Hi, everyone. This is Mike Columbus with Google Cloud. And I'm going to take you through IPv6 integration with the Google Cloud global load balancer. Let's now take a look at our configuration for our global load balancer. The first thing you'll notice is that we have a single IPv4 address that's reachable via Anycast to Google's points of presence. Since the load balancer is a global entity, we can also see we have two back ends in different regions within Google Cloud Platform. The first, Europe West 1, the second, US East 1. Both instance groups are configured for three instances and will auto scale based on load balancer usage. We now have a new requirement to add IPv6 termination on our global load balancer. Let's show you how that's configured. First, we'll go into our external IP addresses, and we can see that we've already reserved an IPv6 address. 
Let's now add this to our load balancer front end by editing its configuration. We'll select front end configuration and add our reserved IPv6 address to the load balancer. We'll select done and update. While we're waiting for our IPv6 address to be attached to our load balancer, let's go into Cloud DNS and look at our managed zones. We can see we have a zone for gcpnetworking.com. Let's add an IPv6 record to this zone. We'll do this by adding a record set for www.gcpnetworking.com of type quad A, and we'll paste in our IPv6 address for our load balancer. We'll then click Create. With our records in place, let's now connect to www.gcpnetworking.com. You can see we have both IPv4 and v6 records in place. We'll connect to the site using Chrome. Our website has been configured to provide us information about the connection. The first thing you see is our client IP address, which is an IPv6 address. The client then connects to our load balancer, which is also an IPv6 address, as you can see here. The load balancer then proxies this connection to IPv4 to our back end, which lives in US East 1D. In this connection, I was load balanced to a back end in US East, which makes sense since I'm from Boston. But how would this look for a client based in Europe? Let's remote into a machine in Europe to find out. Here, we'll connect again to www.gcpnetworking.com. When I connect to this site, you can see that I'm load balanced to a Europe back end and you can see that this one lives in Europe West 1B. Thank you for your time today. You can see on Google Cloud Platform we've configured a globally available IPv6 load balancing solution using Anycast in about the time it takes to make a cup of coffee. So you're the first set of people to actually view this demo, so thank you for staying with us.